Hide your faith from the light of reason. It's now time for counter apologetics. What can you say about Euthyphro that hasn't already been said? Is that a Socratic question? That was more of a rhetorical question. And what is good? In that uh, everybody listening to this show is probably very familiar with Euthyphro's dilemma and probably familiar with some of the critiques against it. For those who are not, here's a quick overview. This challenge to philosophy of religion is called Euthyphro's Dilemma because it's taken from Plato's dialogue between Socrates and Euthyphro. You know, usually out of that whole dialogue, most people only talk about the one or two sentences where Socrates sets up his famous dilemma. But I would really encourage people who are interested to read the entire dialogue. There's actually a lot of good things in there that are still relevant today. Here's real quick one of the lesser quoted passages from the Euthyphro dialogue. Socrates asks, well, what if Euthyphro does prove to me that all the gods regard the death of this serf as unjust? How do I know anything more about the nature of piety and impiety? For granting that this action may be hateful to the gods, still, piety and impiety are not adequately defined by these distinctions. For what is hateful to the gods has also been shown to be pleasing and dear to them. So the dialogue is discussing this, is trying to figure out this nature between impiety and piety, and in question is the unjust death of a uh, of a slave. But what Socrates is bringing up is in their polytheistic system, if piety is what the gods desire and impiety is what the gods dislike, well, you have some contradictions there because the gods are not all of one mind. And uh, I think they're even consistent within themselves. Right. Yeah. And we have parallels, of course, to the biblical example because we have Yahweh commanding thou shall not kill, but other times ordering people to kill. Mm -hmm. We have Yahweh punishing people for their jealousy, but boasting in his own jealousy. You know, there doesn't always seem to be a lot of consistency in the biblical narrative to what is really righteous or what isn't. So it's a... You know, it's a meaningful question even for studying religion today. But, of course, what Socrates points out is before we even get to this question, before we can even satisfactorily answer this one, there's a deeper question underlying it, and that is the famous Euthyphro dilemma. So from the dialogue, the point which I should first wish to understand is whether the pious or the holy is beloved by the gods because it is holy, or is it holy because it is beloved by the gods. I think as we typically try to translate that into our present needs, does God approve of something because it is good, or is something good because God approves of it? Why it is a dilemma is because if you think of it in relation to the Christian God, either horn of the dilemma you take is very unsatisfactory. If we take the second horn of the dilemma and say that good is whatever God approves of, then goodness is really arbitrary. God could just as well command murder, rape, torture, anything at all, and we would still call it good. Key to this is that God has no moral reason to command us to love as opposed to hate. Uh, He might have reasons, but they can't possibly be moral because love and hate Neither one of those states is any intrinsically better than the other. Now, if we take the first horn, God approves of something because it's good. The idea of perfect goodness might still be intelligible, but goodness would exist separate from God. Knowledge of goodness might not even depend on God either. And this seems very unsatisfactory uh, for most Christians because it, it implies that God is obedient, has to be obedient to some sort of standard of morality outside of himself, right? And ultimately, the good doesn't depend on him. J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig, in their Philosophical Foundations for the Christian Worldview, put it this way, this alternative is taken to be incompatible with classical theism because it compromises the sovereignty and aseity of God. God is himself duty-bound to obey certain moral principles, not of his own creation, but as if it were imposed on him. And obviously, this this doesn't fit the Christian God very well either. Well, we're familiar with that dilemma, and many Christian philosophers have felt rather strongly that they have answered it, that this is not – this is really a false dilemma. Mm -hmm. There are other options here. And in fact, I've on previous episodes even conceded that I might agree with them. I might agree that this solution is workable. 
Um, I guess my position on the show has always been the metaphysical grounding of the good in theism is is not really the key question. The real question is, is God's goodness or God's holiness intelligible? Can we actually understand what it means to even say God is holy? Because I think it's a nonsensical concept that we really can't put any content to. And so I've just kind of not paid attention to the whole Euthyphro dilemma for years. Uh, to me, it was a it was a dead issue. But my mind has recently been changed by reading an essay by Jeremy Coons. The paper is called, Can God's Goodness Save the Divine Command Theory from Euthyphro? Published in the European Journal for Philosophy of Religion. And what Coons shows is something uh, actually Justin and I have argued on the show before, or at least we mentioned. We've, we've made the case that maybe the Euthyphro's dilemma, the solutions to it, just push back the dilemma one step. But Coons gives a really convincing argument as to why. I suppose first I should talk about the way in which philosophers of religion typically try to split the horns of the dilemma. You've probably heard this from William Lane Craig, uh, William Alston, probably lesser known name, and uh, Robert Adams both make this same case, and it's a, it's a pretty popular option. The idea is if we view God's own nature as the standard of goodness, this will somehow solve the problem. Why exactly is that? Well, if God's nature is essentially good, then all good qualities, whatever they are, being loving, being just, being merciful, then those are also qualities of God. Now, that seems not to be much less arbitrary than, than either of the horns we talked about before. But if you think about it, it is slightly different. In this kind of scenario, God cannot act or cause somebody to act in a way that's contrary to his nature. So he can't just do anything he wants. On the second horn of the original Euthyphro dilemma, that was kind of a might-makes-right morality. Whatever God says is good is good. Mm -hmm. uh, in this one, he can't just be capricious and arbitrary. He is kind of bound to his own nature. So it's impossible to have a scenario uh, where God commands people to hate and hate becomes good if, if lovingness is an essential part of God's own character. Uh, God's nature as the standard of goodness actually constrains what goods are possible, and thus goodness is not arbitrary. But then it sounds like, okay, so is God duty-bound to his own nature? Does, it, does he have to follow certain moral principles, like the first horn would say? And actually, this seems to get around that objection too, because God will follow his own nature, of course, but he doesn't have to choose to do the right thing. He doesn't have to hold up his behavior to some standard and make sure he's conforming. God would just naturally do what's right, as if by instinct. Uh, he actually can't act in any other way. Now, what's interesting about this idea, if God is not following some sort of external standard to himself, that might actually resolve some of the other weird quirks of biblical morality. Uh, here, let me uh, quote Moreland and Craig one more time about God not being duty-bound. They say, taking the life of an innocent person is something we have no right to do, but God is not similarly restricted. I know, that's a doozy right there. <laughs> this is not to say that God could have brought it about, that it be a general moral duty for people to kill one another. Issuing a general command that we, that we should seek another's harm would be contrary to God's loving nature. But in the extraordinary case of Abraham and Isaac, if you recall, right, God commanding Abraham to sacrifice his son. Go kill your son for me. He says it was not unloving of God to so try Abraham's devotion. God had good reasons for testing him so severely. So this is Isaac felt the same way right. about that. The way, yeah, I again, I'm kind of cringing at the very thought. Mm -hmm. But at least philosophically, see what he's what he's kind of pointed out here is that we're getting away from morality as a strict set of commands. We're actually seeing this as a more character approach. Uh, morality is in these virtues of loving justice and everything else. And we know that the particular circumstances, sometimes what is loving, what is just, and that sort of thing might, might change. It might go against, you know, certain principles or laws. Tough love. And so that's what's going on when God commands people sometimes to kill. 
That's what's going on when God sometimes, you know, changes the commandments for people at a particular point in time. Those commandments were never the standard of goodness. God's character was, and he was determining the, what commandments people should follow based on his own character. Doesn't that render it unfalsifiable for us to find out what things we should do? Uh, that's what I was just thinking. <laughs> because well, we, we need to trust like, God. Trust God, and then he has his reasons, but then how do we derive any sense of what we should do? Yeah, trust that? God, but that doesn't mean we should do the things that he does. Well, yeah, there, I actually do think there is an intelligibility issue here, too, because if if some of these really terrible actions are actually for a loving reason, we would have a hard time looking at the world around us and determining what God's will was. Right. So there are epistemological issues very closely tied into this, some that we've already talked about. I think that's why I was initially convinced, and I think a lot of uh, apologists are convinced— that this is a pretty clever way out of Socrates' trap. God's holiness here is not capricious or arbitrary. It's not measured against any standard apart from his own nature. He can act in a way that contradicts his commands or demand others do so as well, but he has good moral reasons that are fully consistent with his nature for doing so. doesn't seem to be much of a problem. But there's something really interesting here that becomes kind of the basis for Kuhn's argument. What if God didn't exist Let's just entertain this as a hypothetical scenario. I, Let's I, say, I can't even yeah, do I know that. it's I, really mm, tough for mm. us to get into this headspace. But let's just pretend that God doesn't exist and we live in a universe where there are actions that seem to match up with descriptions of love, seem to match up with descriptions of justice and everything else. Would love and justice still be good in this other possible world? Because in this scheme, all good qualities are good just because they're held by God. Yeah. Love and justice do not seem to be intrinsically good just on their own, even if in practice they're indistinguishable from divine love and di divine justice. To understand this, I, I want to uh, read a quick quote from Robert Adams. So we get his view, and this is the view shared by Craig and many others. If there is a God that satisfies the conditions imposed by our concept of the good, we might say then excellence is a property faithfully of faithfully imagining God. In a world where no such God exists, nothing would have that property and nothing would be excellent. But beings like us in such a world might have a concept subjectively indistinguishable from our concept of excellence and there might be an objective property that corresponded to it well enough and in sufficiently salient a way – to be the property signified by it, though it would not be the property we in fact signify by excellent. Here's William Alston. We can think of God himself, the individual being, as the supreme standard of goodness. Lovingness is good, a good-making feature, that on which goodness is superveyant, <laughs> not because of the platonic existence of a general principle or fact to the effect that lovingness is good, but because God, the supreme standard of goodness, is loving. Goodness supervenes on every feature of God, not because some general principles are true, but just because they are features of God. This seems really confusing. I'm seeing everybody shaking their heads, right? But think about why Austin is saying this. In this, he has to deny that there is some sort of external standard of goodness to God. Right. So that means... God's goodness has to be logically prior to any of the qualities we would describe his goodness with. So if typically when I say Dave's a good person, well, why is Dave a good person? Because he's mm -hmm. compassionate. He, you know, he uh, tries to pay his bills on time. He well, takes not, care of his daughter. He besmirch my character right. like that. <laughs> I would list all of these attributes of a good person. Mm. But in, in order to maintain there is no external standard to God, they have to claim – no, justice, kindness, love, none of these things are moral on their own. None of them are good on their own. They're only good because they happen to be the qualities that God possesses. So how is that not the horn of arbitrariness? Well, mm -hmm. that, is, that is Jeremy Kuhn's argument. What he's trying to point out here— It just kicks the they, can back a bit. What They've actually gone worse than the original Euthyphro's dilemma here. Because they've emptied the very concept of good of any kind of content. 
that let's just presuppose that whatever that God is good, and then everything else follows from that. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, basically. Here's here's Jeremy Coons. God is good, and in virtue of God's possession of these traits, they too are good. We see then that God cannot be good in virtue of these traits because God's goodness must be logically prior to the goodness of this of those traits. So with this in mind, in short, Alston must answer the question, why is being loving good? By saying traits like being loving are good making because God has them and God is good. But but on Alston's view, when we say God is good, we haven't said anything because Alston's view prevents him from giving any concrete articulation of what goodness is. Basically, goodness becomes this vacuous concept. Perfect goodness and God's goodness you really can't describe it in terms of these moral qualities because the moral qualities themselves, it's basically the order of direction right, here. Yeah. Because if if you think of it that way, the goodness comes from God and goes in the direction of these activities and these virtues. But God's goodness is independent. And what Kuhns points out is there's this new Euthyphro's dilemma that pops up now. Jeremy Kuhns puts the new Euthyphro's dilemma this way. Why is it good to be loving? Is being loving independently good, apart from its being one of God's traits, or is it good merely because God is loving? They have already said that it's not the first. They can't accept that first horn of the dilemma, that loving is independently good. So it must be the case that loving is only good because God is loving. So we're in a similar place now. If God was hateful and God was, you know, unfair, unjust, Mm -hmm. those would be good qualities too. There's nothing intrinsically good about loving or nothing intrinsically bad about being hateful. So maybe, in fact, what we consider to be good because it's what God does is actually in a reverse universe is evil. Yeah, it could be. Because it's it's just – If God has slightly different characteristics – so in Bizarro, He's still the ultimate standard. Bizarro world, it's still whatever uh, Bizarro like slash hate is what's good slash bad. Now, Alston doesn't see this as, as a problem. Alston says that on, on this particular view, uh, meaning that na- God's nature is the standard of goodness, we're not debarred from saying what is supremely good about God. God is good by virtue of being loving, just, merciful, and so on. And he actually he compares it to a kind of meter stick, quoting Alston further. Let's say what makes a certain length of meter is its equality to a standard meter stick kept in Paris. What makes Which this is actually true of the gram, I think? No, there is a meter bar in Paris. But there it but the gram is the one I believe if I have my radio lab cor- correct is the only or kilogram whatever it is is the only measurement that was actually chosen to be equal to this one thing as opposed yeah. to reverse engineered. It, it's it's true. Yeah. The Paris one, the history of his analogy is not entirely accurate. It's a fantastic story. But so yeah, but to, it's, it makes a point. Yes, anyway. He says, well, what makes this table a meter in length is not its conformity to a platonic essence, but its conformity to a concretely existing individual. Mm-hmm. Similarly, on my present suggestion, what most ultimately makes an act of love, a good thing, is not its conformity to some general principle, uh, but its conformity to God, who is both the ultimate source of the existence of things and the supreme standard by which to be assessed. So God is basically the standard now for all goodness, Mm. and we just like love because it looks like God. But uh, again, as Kuhns has pointed out, this turns the goodness of God into what he calls a featureless property. Any aspect, anything that you could typically describe why a person is good doesn't really apply to God. His goodness is logically prior to any of his actions or any of his other attributes. Now, Alston thinks he can get away from this. He says, on this view, we're not debarred from saying what is supremely good about God. God is good in virtue of being love, just, merciful, and so on. Because Alston basically wants to have it both ways. The goodness of loving and justice is explained by there being qualities of God, and God's goodness is explained by possessing these qualities. But Kuhns points out this is a vicious circle. You really haven't actually grounded either of them. Kuhns concludes by saying, in this particularist theory, we have no more or less reason to declare God essentially good than to 
declare him essentially finord or bixtix. He says, <laughs> for calling God good, we haven't really said anything at all. 